The events of 1987 are the stars of the News Quiz of the Year at ten past one. But now we'll settle back for a glorious 55 minutes in the BBC Sound Archives and what now seems another world. At 12.25, Tony Hancock casts his own Christmas spell over the proceedings. But first, a useful checklist, How to Broadcast, which was made for a different audience 36 years ago. This is the BBC Third Programme. How to Broadcast, demonstrated by distinguished members of the Howe Repertory Company. How to Broadcast. These are the, the latest BBC figures. A revenue expenditure, 1,522,211. Salaries for programme staff, 384,000-odd. Ditto for artists and speakers, 472,321. Cold current fluxion, uh, that's something to do with electricity, 36-something. Uh, now then, I, uh, I wonder, Mr Pantel, how much of that you've managed to get. I represent listener research. As uh, you know, I'm a very irregular listener. Yes, but you have listened, I take it. Oh, certainly. Why? Well, I've told you that you are a perfect example of listener type B2, as we call it. B2? Is that fairly good, I mean? Not good or bad, just a type. Oh. The point is, your reactions will be valuable. You formed some conclusions, some preferences. Well, in the last quarter, it's all such a muddle. Well, let me help you. I mean, how about your morning listening? Well, it did strike me when I switched on once or twice. Everybody seemed to be most tremendously young. There was something called, what was it? Hark to Auntie. For the not quite three-year-olds, I seem to remember. Are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. Once there was a big red bus, and what it liked best was a really wet day, because then it could go through the puddles. Splish, splosh, splush, splush. And the big red bus liked doing that very much. But look, before we start, you do oh, realise that you're listening to type B2, and this programme is aimed definitely at type CX4. Well, you asked for my impression. The hmm? bus conductor gave him a ticket and punched a little hole in it. Bing! Like that. Bing! And the big red bus went through a very good puddle. Splish! Splash! Splush! Ha, 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 ha. Yeah. Well, yes. I only mean that everything is tremendously young. Accent on youth. Yeah. And then about 11.20. Ah, that would be broadcasts to schools. I think it was how things began number 42. Fossils. How did it go? I say, Mr Partridge, that does look interesting, doesn't it, Nelly? Oh, I wonder what it is. If you stop calling me Mr Partridge and call me Uncle Arthur, I might tell you. It's a fossil. F. O-S-S-I-L. Oh, I say. I think I know what a fossil is. Good. And you see this one like a great big enormous woodlouse? Oh, yes. It's a trilobite, isn't it? Good, Tim. I expect you've seen an example in your school museum. That's a trilobite, Nelly. T-R-I-L-O-B-I-T-E. And you know how it came there, Tim? Oh, yes. I think that millions and millions of years ago, it fell to the bottom of the sea. Oh, and then millions of years later, tons and tons of mud fell on it, then lots more mud, and it got squashed, then lots and lots more mud, and then some more mud. Quite right, Tim. <sighs> mud. Oh, but you do realise that these programmes for children are some of the best things in broadcasting. Mm. Well, if you will allow me to carry on my morning listening... Then there was something rather surprising that wasn't exactly for children and didn't really belong to the morning. One of the morning repeats? Pardon? Oh, no doubt. Mrs. Job's Journal, is it called? But everybody in it seemed to say quite ordinary things in an unordinary tone of voice. Rather like children acting. Aha. Give us this day our daily cereal. I was expecting Gladys and George to come in for supper because Gladys had been skating with Mr Carmichael and Edna was hoping for a new job. Charlie and Ethel were coming in too and I couldn't think what to give them that was different. What 
shall I give them for supper, Mrs. Kettle? I don't know, I'm sure. Nice piece of hake's always nice, I always say. Yes, I suppose it is. Of course, we could have the meat ration, but that would mean doing without on Sunday. Well, I like that. Oh, Joe, you did make me jump. Sorry, Elsie, dear, but I will not eat scrag end of mutton. No, not even for you. I'll desert you first. Oh, Joe. The things you say, Doctor. We could have resells, only Fred doesn't like them. And Mother ate the last of the meatloaf when Sheila came. Mum, I'm... I'm off to change the library books. Have you got your shopping list ready? Oh, hello, Mrs. Kettle. Hello, Mr. Jack. You don't half look lovely in your new pullover. Is that the one Mrs. Maltis give you? Well, as a matter of fact, it is. I didn't know you were seeing Mrs. Maltis anymore, Jack. I, uh, well, I ran into her accidentally, and she gave me this pullover. Oh, where's the shopping list, Mama? I must be going. Here you are, dear. Ever so much. Yesterday? I thought he was playing cricket with Vernon yesterday. Now, Mr. Panto, from these examples you seem to remember, or half remember, you consider that morning listening is never sufficiently adult? Oh, heavens no, I wouldn't say never. Not on Sundays, for instance. Heavens no. I never heard anything so adult in my life. Not so early in the morning, anyhow. It starts about 12 o'clock, believe me. Hmm. And everybody criticises everything. Do you mean the critics? I don't know about that, but they certainly criticise. They were moderately nice about everything up to a point. And I'm bound to say that nobody could be fairer. I remember they were discussing a television programme. And the idea of the play, I suppose, is... That the idea of Last Emperor was that Henry Ford is really the modern incarnation of the god figure, the man who does... The author put a lot of work into it, I think. He tells a very simple story in very plain verse, perhaps a little too plain. It is a perfectly honest affair. I wonder what you think. But surely... No, one but the... surely... Oh. It was quite telling, wasn't it? But I did feel that one became a little confused between fantasy and realism. Well, I don't... No, the, the, the two modes were mixed. I was in two minds about the author's intention. But, but why does the author's intention matter? Oh, no, of course it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in the least. No, but Charlie, what did you think about it, Burley? Well, I thought the whole thing was so awful that I can hardly talk about it. But roughly speaking, when you dress up Napoleon in a monk's coat, carrying a wooden cross with a spotlight on his head, well, the whole thing becomes to me so completely phony and tasteless and even suggests an atmosphere of the passing of the third floor back which I'm afraid I personally find utterly distasteful. Well, I think... I that's... suppose, in a way, this program was aimed at what you might call the home service audience. Is there such a thing as the home service audience? <laughs> I'm, I'm rather afraid there is. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I, I'm bound to say that it's the first television drama or fantasy or whatever it is that I ever... I suppose it was because I'd never seen the thing they were talking about that I found the critics rather depressing. Rather. Oh, and that reminds me... I have heard quite a lot of bits of art for the people. I mean, education. Education. Mm. But not too obviously, I hope, Mr. Pantel. You mean afternoon programmes? Oh, yes, we're well into the afternoon now. Uh, there was one series, what was it called, which was about architecture and music, and it was called... Oh, called... Don't be afraid of it. Ah. Yes, we're rather proud of that one. Even the people can understand art. Well, I think Don't Be Afraid of It, number 14, was about poetry. And the woman was saying that poetry was quite all right. Think of it as rhythm. The quality of mercy is not strained. Tum, 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 tum. Doesn't it suggest you a rather strange, exciting sort of rhythm? Doesn't it make you want to... I think it does. It makes you want to dance. Let's take Coleridge's Christabel. But don't think of Christabel as a classic. Don't, whatever you do, think of Coleridge as Coleridge. But just that exciting and wonderful rhythm. Tis the middle of night by the castle clock. Pong, pong, pong. You see, you, you feel the rhythm of dancing. It's like when you're dancing with your boyfriend. Tis the middle of night by the castle clock. One, two, reverse, slide. And the owl has awakened the crowing cock. One, two, reverse, slide. Two, with two, who. One, two, reverse. Of course, I love that. And I very much liked Don't Be Afraid, number 34. That was about a Beethoven sonata. Beethoven. 
the Waldstein Sonata. <laughs> that sounds very terrible, doesn't it? Opus 53. Now, 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 don't worry about Opus. Maybe he liked to number his works. Why not? In C major. Well, forget that altogether. But let us think that Beethoven had a friend. He was called Waldstein. And Beethoven wanted to write this piece of music for this friend, as you might want to speak to Ted or Johnny. Ring up Ted or Johnny, perhaps, and then have something to say. At the beginning of the sonata, Beethoven wants to speak. Won't his friend Waldstein come? He wishes to get in touch. <laughs> The ringing of the phone bell, it might be, eh, with a question mark at the end. And then, then he pleads. In these chords you can hear he pleads. Won't Waldstein come? remember they're quite right mr panto i seriously think some of our programs about music are the most interesting we have and why does education get on your nerves well, i agree and i like education but i don't like it too much disguised now could you explain this please if it's a tercentenary of london bridge or an anniversary of monmouth's rebellion why not simply tell us the historical point and leave it at that why give us a lot of rather peculiar dialogue with music sandwiched in between and why call it... They blaze the path of freedom, number 27. Those numbers. The Battle of Taunton Moor. You, serving man, what's the clock? Here have I been scratching out my night in a flea bed. Off they go. The old England has been destroyed and there is none to replace it. What brings you here? It's faith in the Lord. <laughs> Richard! William! This is the Duke. My Lord, we will hold your secrecy safe. But, my Lord, you mince along too delicate for secrecy. You want an honest sow herd's gate. Ah, I'm as hungry as such. Tis humble fare, Your Grace. Just a mess of milk and eggs and sugar and cream. Cousin to these parts. Delightful, isn't it? You know, I long for a little fact, a little objectivity, something more straightforward, even just pure description. Objective fact and pure description? Then you must try our OBs, our Outside Broadcasting Recording Department. Scenes described on the spot. Actuality, objectivity. This is the BBC Home Service bringing you to London. In the heart of a busy London suburb, we bring you with recording gear and commentators through a street deep imbued with tradition and commonplace. The spine of London, which is the hub of a thriving borough, the Balham High Road. Over then to John Vaughan Nimbleby and the Balham High Road. Over to you, John Vaughan. Uh, this is me, John, uh, John Vaughan Dimbleby, and we're very happy here on board this tram, one of the last trams to run, perhaps, on this road of romance and fiction. Uh, we're moving up now by Clapham South Underground Station to the Balham High Road, ten twisting furlongs of it. The cinemas elbowing against glass-fronted shops, uh, the, the windows of the shops about the size of ten large packing cases in area. Uh, by the way, I see this tram is number B36241. Now, how did it come to be that number, Driver Akehurst? That's the number in the registration book, the next number to B36240. The next to that one, is it? Well, here's our little tram then, bravely bearing its registration number like a flag. 
Uh, now, uh, how far away is Big Ben now? Uh, about seven miles, do you think? About six now. Uh, thank you, Joe. Again, you get the sense of traffic, of moving objects, of lights now moving, now stopped. Yes, the whole romance of SW12 is contained in this vast street. So forward now to join Leonard Hodson at the old cable repairing depot by Marilla Garth. Yes, this is where the cables, the underground cables of the tramways, are repaired for this district. And I can say that it's perfectly amazing to see the cables coming in shattered and worn, and the new cables being taken out completely repaired, and in fairly good order, I guess, don't they, Mr. Bloxton? And how many cables do you say you get through in a year? 600. That's a very remarkable figure. Uh, uh, 60. Uh, fair enough, Mr. Bloxton. A very fine target, too. No less than 60 cables. You've got to imagine the rubber welding stoves, as they're called, looking rather like vast cactus. Always paper baskets turned the wrong way up. Uh, over to you then, John Vaughan Dimbleby. Uh, thank you, Leonard. Well, here I am, John Vaughan Dimbleby, uh, once more in our trusty tram. Now, right ahead of us is the entrance to the tunnel over which the Southern Electric trains flash uh, in olden times, the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway. Uh, underneath that old entrance, uh, which can scarcely have been touched since Kipling's day, uh, steam engines once bore their message. Uh, there is a muddy gutter over which Raleigh might have laid his cloak. Uh, you remember Pointer's famous painting. Uh, now, trains leave this station bearing Balaam's message to London and the big terminus thronged with thriving workers. Uh, these lads, uh, standing outside that pub, uh, must be 30 years old, uh, stand where their fathers stood before. Uh, let's hail them as we go by. And now, as we pass under the bridge, uh, let's look at the way ahead. Those points of light like a frieze on a willow pattern plate are the lights of Tooting Beck Road. Over to you then, Tooting, and goodbye to Balaam and all its romance. A last wave then to Balaam. Give them a clang, Skipper. And among the friendly cheers of the departing Balamers, we say goodbye to you too, listeners, and goodbye, alas, to our trusty B36241. Of course, it's awfully English. Yes, isn't it? We couldn't have something a little less English and a little bit gayer, could we? Well, of course, the... The variety department provides the gaiety, and just recently it's gone quite foreign. In fact, I think they've discovered France. Our next guest in fits and starts will be introduced to you by our old friend Bill Swinston, if I can get him out of the bass drum. <laughs> Bill! Hey, Bill, come over here! Oh, me? I'm far from fit. Ah, you'll feel all right when I tell you who our next guest is. Now, picture the Eiffel Tower. Aye. Picture a gay little cafe on the corner. Aye, I feel better already. I'm feeling fit. Oh, yeah, the essence of that lovely city of laughter is the chicest little Parisienne of them all. Oh, la la, lead me to her, lead okay. me to her. Okay. Bill, this is Colette Mignon. Colette, this is Bill. Hello, Bill. Hello, Colette. Where? Qu'est-ce que ça veut dire, where? What does it mean, where, Bill? Well, it means, it means why couldn't I keep my big boots shut? Well, 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 it means you're a bit of all right, Colette, and per de okay. I think you are who are too, Bill. Well, I'm far from fit. <laughs> very funny. And I especially notice it, because variety isn't always very funny. Sometimes even the comedian seems to think so. Well, I was walking along the street just now, and I saw a man I know. His name was Smithers Pomfret, and he was carrying a zither. Well, he was the third man I'd seen with a zither in a week. <laughs> oh, well, that goes better with film fans. He said, how about a quick cuppa? So, of course, I said, suits me to a T. <laughs> well, that's what it says in the script. No wonder the script writers are starving. <laughs> well, where was I? Oh, yes. I was having a cup of tea with a sailor. Well, of course, we can always try the third program. Very good idea. Provided, of course, that it's a good night. Oh, but the third program's always good. That's the point. Well, yes, of course, it's frightfully good. The only thing is that it just so happens that for me, it is sometimes a little bit difficult to get. Why, it's as clear as a bell at Cape Roth, but at 14 Danescourt Gardens. Ah, there's that wonderful translation of Virgil, for instance, going on now. The king of gods and men has granted you the rule of the wind to lull the waves or lift. Fairly clear. I'll try Please turning my knob a hair's bit to the right. Transporting toys defeated God's wisdom. Ah, oh, uh, here's bet to the left. those ships and sink them. Flail the crews apart. Litter the sea with their fragments. Oh, Lord, I, I'll try to in the knob again. Hello. Where are we now? Hello, folks. 
Well, here I am again, tucked up cosily in this little old BBC top floor studio with the wax stacked at my elbow. All the platters that matter for half an hour of fun. Yes, pussy, I said fun. Well, that's just your opinion, puss. Now, this first one is one of your own very special personal favourites. How's about a new label from Need I Must I Tell You? Yes, it's our old friend, the Choo Choo Girl. If you were stranded on a desert island with a portable gramophone... Oh, where are we now? Have I really suggested that I should take that disc to a desert island? And an unlimited supply of needles, what eight gramophone records would you take with you? Let us hear the choice of an act. like to have one particular piece of music that has always meant a great deal to me because of its inspiring melody and uplifting magic. When I first heard it, I couldn't speak for nearly an hour. If you had to take ten books with you to prison, why would you not choose Pilgrim's oh, Progress? Wait a minute. If you were alone on the Eiffel Tower, which ten favorite pictures would you bring with you? I shall go mad. <laughs> Dead on time. Not bad going. Yeah. Well, good night, Geoffrey. Good night. Night, Hopper. Good night, Geoffrey. Good night. Maybe I'm going to think so. How to Broadcast was written by Joyce Grenfell and Stephen Potter and demonstrated by Joyce Grenfell, Betty Hardy, Ronald Simpson, Derek Geiler, Geoffrey Wincott, Alan Reed. Elvin Brook Jones, Carlton Hobbs, Roy Plumley. The production was by Stephen Potter.